So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Heidelberg Joint Astronomical Colloquium on Tuesday, as always, at 16.00. Before I start, I'd like to ask the Zoom audience if somebody could put a thumbs up to confirm that they can hear me. I, I take that for a yes. So, okay, let's really start now. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, well, again, um, this week we're going away from the planets, last week's topic, into the interstellar medium, and we're going to hear from a, one of the real upcoming experts in the field from the theory, theory point of view on how stars form and even how one might actually predict how they form from basic physics. So I'm going to hand over to Ralph Klesson, who's Blakesley Burkhardt's host, and he'll give the formal introduction. So, thank you. Welcome, uh, everyone, and a warm welcome to you, Blakesley, for giving today's colloquium here in this uh, auditorium. Uh, we will be hearing about turbulence from the beginnings in the interstellar medium and ending up with a predictive theory of star formation. <laughs> and I think that fits in very well to many of the research topics here in Heidelberg. Uh, let me introduce the speaker uh, quickly. You did your uh, PhD in Wisconsin That's with right. Alex Lazari and working on one of the most complex uh, topics in astrophysics magnetic fields and how to you know, learn more about it from observations. Um, after a very successful PhD thesis, you went to uh, Harvard, to the uh, CFA and to the Institute for Theory and Computation where you had an Einstein Fellowship and after that, you moved a bit further, what is it, south, yes, west? Yes, a little warmer. <laughs> uh, a little warmer to uh, New York, to um, uh, the um, CCI, the Center for Computational Astrophysics, uh, at a very, uh, how shall I say, iconic place, the Flat Iron uh, Building. and. Uh, at the same time, she was also appointed a professor at Rutgers University, and she's now holding um, both positions at the same time. I guess you do lots of commuting yes. <laughs> back and forth. Um, Blakesley is, as um, uh, Richard already pointed out, well known for her theoretical models trying to link magnetic fields dynamics of the interstellar medium, turbulence, star formation, and observations together. Uh, she has been working on methods to identify and characterize magnetic fields. Um, she has been working recently a lot on turbulence star formation theory, which we will learn more about today. And she is also strongly trying to connect these uh, theoretical findings to the observation domain and for instance she is involved in a new you know, proposal for a mid-size uh, uh, class NASA mission Hyperion um, which is not just the moon in the solar system but <laughs> also a great observational project and we will hear more about it. Yeah. So a very warm welcome to Blake Slipperkant. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and it's always a pleasure to be in Heidelberg. I've been here now several times, uh, and I always feel like I never stay long enough. Um, and there's, you know, both from the research point of view, there's so many amazing um, areas of overlap with, with my own interests, as well as the city is so beautiful, and I love German food, and it's just wonderful to be here. So thank you for having me. Uh, and I'm really excited to tell you about some work that myself and my collaborators, who are also listed here on the title slide, have been thinking about in terms of uh, building upon and improving uh, analytic models of star formation, which start from initial conditions that are very complex physics, right? Turbulent initial conditions, um, which also include magnetic fields and complicated galaxy dynamics. And so how can we, you know, taking all this very complex physics, how can we distill this down into uh, a model that can provide some predictions for things like the star formation efficiencies, the star formation rates, etc.? That's going to be the goal of the talk today, and I won't have solved it by the end of the hour, but I hope I'll have convinced you that we have indeed made some progress. Um, and throughout the talk, I'll also, uh, for, for those who maybe don't know what is turbulence and why do we care about star formation, hopefully you'll also walk away from this talk with a little bit of a sense about how these things are interconnected. 
And so the importance of this is actually very nicely stated in the recent U.S. Uh, astro decadal, the 2020 decadal survey that came out um, from the United States. There were three main uh, scientific areas that should be focused upon based on this recommendation for the next 10 years. And you can probably guess the other, the two of them, exoplanets and gravitational waves, right? Those are like really hot right now. But I was really excited to see this uh, third uh, uh, push priority from the Astro 2020 decadal, um, which is cosmic ecosystems. So understanding what drives galaxy growth throughout cosmic time. And of course, this is something that JWST is going to make major headway on in the coming years. And even, even in this year, we'll already start to see amazing data from the high redshift universe, uh, how gas moves into galaxies, how it then moves into stars, and then how those stars then back react on the large scale galactic environment through feedback process. Right? So feedback here can be uh, delayed feedback, like supernova feedback. It can also be more immediate feedback processes, like uh, the ionizing photons, uh, the winds and the jets that come out of young, young stars. So this is uh, exciting because turbulence, right? this, this aspect of turbulence here actually made it into this, this main figure from the Astro uh, Decadal Survey because we ultimately need to understand how the dynamics of the gas are linked to all of those properties of galaxy growth. And the gas is inherently turbulent. So what's the outline of the talk? Here we go. So I want to step back and talk just about very generally in star formation. What is the problem? What are the problems of star formation? Um, what, what, are the, what are the big questions in the community? I won't um, focus on all of them for this talk. I'm going to mostly talk about how you characterize the conversion of gas into stars, which is something called the star formation efficiency problem. Um, how is turbulence linked to that? So maybe some of you, you're like, turbulence is like the thing that I experience on the airplane when it gets really uncomfortable and bouncy. What does that have to do with star formation? So I want to give you a sense of that. And then I'm going to go into more uh, the analytic theories of star formation, turbulence regulated, uh, both from our kind of the previous work that's been done in this field and then our, our, our current work. And then I'm going to finally show you a comparison with simulations and observations so that you can be convinced that we've at least made some progress here. All right, so star formation. Why should you care about star formation? Well, I think this is the easy part of, of the talk, right? Because star formation, you know, the formation of stars is really at the intermediate scale between all the things we care about in astrophysics, right? Obviously, as you go to smaller scales, you have planet formation, you have life, you have biology. As you go to larger scales, uh, you have the cosmic uh, environment, galaxy formation, all the cool physics there. So star formation, the formation of the stars, is really the fundamental intermediate point for that process. Uh, if you're like, oh, I'm a compact object person, I don't care about star formation. Well, you should, right? Because of course, the formation of massive stars is, is, is the first step towards getting you the progenitors of, of all our cool LIGO events uh, that we're, we're detecting more and more of. So how those black holes end up forming, merging, etc. Um, you, need, you need to understand what sets the initial mass function for that process. If you're like, ah, I'm more of a galaxy person, well, of course, feedback from, again, supermassive stars uh, uh, sets the supernova rate, which then drives outflows in galaxies um, and, and is important for the overall um, setting the, the dynamics of the um, circumgalactic medium and, and the heating and cooling processes therein. And then, of course, planet formation, right? If you don't have star formation, you don't have planet formation. So we need to really think about star formation as a problem we should solve in astrophysics if we really want to understand all of these different other areas of astronomy. So as I mentioned, I'm not going to go through all the various problems that we have in the star formation community. That would be like a whole week-long conference. And I just went to like five of them, so I'm a little bit tired. Henrik's smiling because he also was at some of those conferences. I'm going to kind of focus on one problem, and I think it's also a very easy to understand problem. And it's kind of mind-boggling to think that this problem has been around for so many decades, and that's the star formation efficiency problem. You can do just a very simple back of the envelope calculation to show why this is a problem. Right? So if you take uh, just purely a gravitational collapse of a parcel of gas, say even the gas in this room, you can calculate something called the free fall time. That only depends on the density, right? It's the, the time scale over which you'll have self-gravitating collapse of any, any kind of gas, 
right? And again, this, this only depends on the density. So we can take an average interstellar density or an average uh, maybe molecular density of around 17 uh, cubic centimeter. We can get a time scale that we should have for collapse, three times 10 to the six years. Then we can say, well, we can roughly estimate the amount of molecular gas in a galaxy, and then we can divide that mass by the time scale and get a star formation rate, right? So that would give us a star formation rate of about 250 solar masses per year, right? If we took the amount of molecular gas in the galaxy divided by its characteristic freefall time, that is way larger, right, than the actual observed star formation rate, right, by a factor of about 100. So the actual rate is more like one to three solar masses a year. So something is slowing star formation down, right? It's beyond just, we, we have, should have additional physics uh, than just the self-gravitational collapse. So I, the way I kind of like to word this, right, is that the problem of star formation efficiency is not how to form stars. Right, it's how to not form stars. How do you prevent that gas from becoming just uh, gravitationally unstable and, and collapsing and everything forming stars? So the observational way of seeing this problem, right, this kind of 1% conversion of gas into stars, there's many, many different observational papers that you could pull out that show this 1% efficiency. I've decided to show one of my favorite plots um, from krumholtz deckel mckee 2012. Um, and this plot here is one of my favorites because it combines a lot of scales. And it shows something really fascinating about this, the conversion of gas into stars. And that's that it goes about 1% with a lot of scatter, but still about 1% in both local clouds, Milky Way environment, and also other galaxies, high redshift galaxies, starburst galaxies, a wide, wide range of galactic environments, right? And so what you're seeing here is the star formation rate surface density on the y-axis. On the x-axis is the gas surface density, so it's typical kind of Kennecott-Schmidt-like plot, if you're familiar with those, but divided by the, the characteristic freefall time that I was just talking about. So that conversion of, of uh, gas into stars on the freefall time, you can call that the uh, star formation efficiency per freefall time. Right, and this, this line that's going through here is suggesting that that's around 1% in a huge range of galactic environments, right? There's no reason why both the mean and the scatter for local clouds should be similar to the high redshift universe, right? And so this is, I think, a very interesting theoretical challenge, how you can get this 1% in all these different environments. It must have something to do fundamentally with the local environment that's set by feedback and gravity, right? Like fundamental processes. If the IMF is maybe not variable, right, the initial mass function, um, in these different environments, if gravity is acting the same in all the different environments, then maybe that's fundamentally why this doesn't change too strongly with environment. Right, and so can we build a simple model for this is the question. That's the, the goal of the talk. All right, so how is star formation linked to turbulence? So far I haven't mentioned turbulence at all. Like what's, what's going on there? What is turbulence, right? You can even step back and say, well, what, what do you even mean by turbulence? And actually, if you ask an engineer or a mathematician um, this question, they will give you probably a different answer than a physicist or an astrophysicist. And if you talk to an engineer, they'll definitely probably tell you, well, the Reynolds number is the key thing that makes a flow transition from smooth and laminar to uh, eddies, vorticities, and turbulence, right? And the Reynolds number is a fundamental parameter for this kind of turbulence problem because it pops right out of the Navier-Stokes equations. So here's your momentum equation. You have inertial terms, right, that only depend on um, velocity uh, and, and scale of the system. And you have viscous terms that also have a dependence on the fluid viscosity, right? So honey being more viscous than air, harder to make turbulent. If you kind of do a dimensional analysis and take their ratio, you get something called the Reynolds number, right? And so higher and higher Reynolds number flow, you'll eventually transition to turbulence. And that transition actually doesn't have a very high value. It's very easy to get flows to be turbulent around Reynolds numbers of 10 to the 3 or so. And if you do, again, like a back of the envelope calculation for the interstellar medium, so plugging in kind of typical velocities and typical length scales and viscosities for the interstellar medium, which are astrophysical in size, you can easily get Reynolds numbers of like 10 to the 10. So just, just purely from looking at the Reynolds numbers of the interstellar medium, we expect turbulence to be there. 
And then if you want to also talk about what properties turbulence has, you can talk about like an energy cascade. So once you get this transition, high Reynolds number transition to a turbulent flow, you can then say, well, what does that turbulence fundamentally do to the dynamics of the gas? And this is where the energy cascade comes in. So you have some injection of energy that produces this high Reynolds number flow that happens at some, let's say, large scale. This is what's called the injection scale. And then this energy then cascades to smaller and smaller scales. So you can think of eddies that come from uh, very large scales and break up into smaller and smaller scales. These eddies transfer energy, right? And they transfer energy down until essentially the dissipation scale. Now, in reality, this can be more complicated, right? So we have in the ISM a magnetic field, so that can also change the scales of the dissipation. Uh, we can have multiple injection sources of, of energy. So you can imagine in this cartoon picture, you have injection scales at, at happening at multiple points in the cascade. Um, but generally, you get these three range scales of interest, right? So the, the injection, the self-similar cascade of energy, which is the inertial range, and then finally, the energy then dissipates. Right? And all the cool um, results of, of, in the turbulence community primarily focus on the scaling of the inertial range. Like how, how does that energy scale? Is it like uh, the Kolmogorov 1941 picture where you have a 5 3rd slope, which you can then derive pretty easily from dimensional analysis arguments and the cascade being uh, energy conserving? Or is it more like a shock type of process where you get like a minus 2 slope for Berger's turbulence? Um, or an MHD cascade where you can have some, maybe something in between those things. Um, so this is like a central question of the turbulence community. I won't talk about that further, but I will hopefully give you an intuitive sense of how turbulence can affect star formation. And I'll just say that turbulence in general, you know, it's not just important for star formation. Um, flash again that decadal figure there. Um, it's important for a lot of just any as aspect of astrophysics that touches on gas physics, right? So you can talk about any kind of accretion disk physics, uh, the CGM or the intercluster medium, um, you know, the stellar wind, astrospheres, cosmic ray transport. There's so many areas in astrophysics that this, this topic of turbulence comes up, the scaling laws of turbulence, how to measure turbulence, et cetera. But again, we're going to focus here on star formation today. So I want to try to give you an intuitive sense of how turbulence can change star formation. I'm going to show some simulations there on the left um, that were performed with, uh, in collaboration with Christoph Federath uh, and my student Sabrina Apple. And turbulence has two aspects, to, to fundamental aspects for the star formation problem. On one hand, it can promote star formation. Right? If you turn on turbulence, you turn on supersonic motions, the turbulence is very strong, you get shocks in the medium, and those shocks in this video are what's collapsing. So here, here we can see it kind of visualized. Let me start it again. Right? We have some density fluctuations that were produced by a turbulent uh, cascade. Those density fluctuations will be the first things to collapse because, again, remember the free fall time is inversely proportional to the square root of the density. Right? And so the very dense regions have the shorter free fall time. They collapse very quickly. Right? And so this is how the density fluctuations produced by supersonic motions enhance star formation, right? enhance the star formation rate. So this is one effect. But there's an opposing effect, which makes things more complicated. And that's turbulence decreases star formation. So in this video here, I had essentially just had gravity. Maybe you could kind of get a sense of it because you know, what's happening very quickly in terms of collapse is the dense regions, and then these very diffuse regions collapse on their own local free fall time at a much slower rate. What if I turn on turbulent driving and just keep the turbulent motions going, so then you can see effect two, right? So here now you see a much more dynamic picture where we continuously drive turbulent motions, and those same density fluctuations, the initial conditions were the same between them, right? Follow your favorite filament, my favorite filament is this one here. It's much, much slower to collapse than the previous case, even though the densities are the same. So this right away tells you that, well, Blakesley, the first calculation you showed me of the free fall time and the star formation rate, something slowing down turbulence, aha, it, it, it's slowing down star formation. It must be turbulent motions doing something there, right? Increasing uh, turbulent pressure support, adding vorticity uh, and shear, all of these dynamical uh, aspects of how uh, the, the turbulence interacts with the gas are slowing down star formation. So there's these two aspects of, of turbulence. Um, and, you know, 
now that you've seen how important turbulence is, you're probably going to be really excited to rush out and do your own turbulence research. And so just as a quick advertisement for the simulations I just showed and others that I won't show in this talk, um, you can actually download many of them at mhdturbulence.com. Um, there's many simulations for many codes there um, that you can also uh, access. So this is the catalog for astrophysical turbulence simulations that you can, you can then go and, and download and, and play with those turbulent box simulations. OK, so you have, a, you have a sense now that turbulence is, is complicating the star formation picture, right? So it, it both promotes, tur it promotes star formation, it, it uh, decreases star formation. It's, it's complicated. How would you put this into an analytic model, especially one that's kind of in a simple sense? And so that's, that's where I'm going next, right? And this is, I'm not, you know, by far the first person to think about this. There are many, many papers that have tried to simplify this turbulent picture of star formation into a, an easy um, to calculate kind of analytic model. And this takes the imprint of that density fluctuations that you saw into a one-point statistic, right? And this is the probability distribution function uh, of the density field. And it's well known uh, that the turbulence, especially supersonic turbulence, should produce what we call a log normal function for this density distribution uh, through the central limit theorem and through the interaction of shocks. Um, so this is a cartoon of that, and I'll show you a little bit how turbulence promotes that. But once you have the density distribution, and it's a simple log normal, you can very easily integrate uh, over the amount of uh, density that you think should be star forming. Right? So let's say you have some uh, critical density uh, at which you think the turbulence, the thermal support, maybe magnetic support, should no longer hold up the cloud against gravitational collapse, and you should get basically uh, a free fall kind of situation. If you knew that density, then you could easily plug it into this integral and calculate a star formation rate or an efficiency per free fall, um, et cetera. And so this kind of approach of using the density PDF has been used in many different uh, situations and papers. I've listed just a couple here um, where people have uh, used essentially this density PDF kind of approach and integral to do things like estimate the efficiencies and the star formation rates, uh, get the kennicott schmidt scaling, um, and uh, you know, even stuff like the in initial mass function. Uh, if you know how this density PDF will fragment, you can do that. So how does this work, right? If we have a log normal, we just need to know what sets the distribution uh, of the width and so forth. So there's been a lot of work previously done in the last couple of decades uh, by myself and, and other um, people who are interested in these turbulent simulations. So here's a cool movie um, from Daniel Price and Christoph Federath in 2010 showing the development of supersonic turbulence in one of these driven box simulations and then the corresponding density PDF that results. So you can see that when you start to drive these turbulent motions, you naturally develop this log normal density distribution. Now, how does this scale with the turbulent parameters? So for example, the strength of the turbulence. So one way you could parameterize that is the sonic Mach number, right? If you leave the temperature of the simulation the same, so it's an isothermal simulation, and you just change the velocity uh, uh, scaling of the turbulence up or down, so that can char be characterized by the Mach number. Or maybe another parameter of interest here would be how you drive the turbulence, whether it's from compressive type motions or stirring solenoidal type motions. So that's another parameter. Um, but essentially, as you increase or decrease those, those Mach number or that uh, compressibility, you widen the density PDF. So I can show like a little simulation of that here. These are one of my box simulations with a low Mach number. So you don't have strong density fluctuations. It's almost incompressible. So there's not, not large density fluctuations here. And the corresponding density PDF is very narrow, right? So you can imagine for the star formation problem, if I have some density that's high enough that I need to get over to form stars to start becoming gravitationally unstable, maybe this simulation doesn't quite cut it. But if I increase the sonic Mach number, right, to something like two, you can already see there's like these nice density fluctuations that develop from the shocks, the PDF gets wider. And I can keep increasing the sonic Mach number and I see that the corresponding PDF continues to get wider and wider, right? And so if you have a critical density, right, that can maybe shift things to having uh, more, more collapse, more material past that critical density. So how would this work in a model, right? So these sort of, turbulent regulated star formation models using this log normal PDF. 
Once you find out what sets the width of the PDF, right, the turbulence properties, your only thing you have left to do is to determine that critical density. Right? And so you can make a bunch of arguments for, well, when should turbulence thermal support and magnetic pressure support overcome self-gravity? Right? So parameters enter there, such things like the virial parameter, um, which is the uh, ratio of the turbulent kinetic energy to gravitational potential energy. Um, so more turbulence, maybe more support. So that kind of complicates this. You have also a Mach number dependence here um, from where uh, gravity overcomes uh, turbulent pressure. Um, but you can essentially make some arguments for this, plug it in, and then you're done. You just need to do a simple interval over a log normal. Well, okay, I'll take one instance that was from Padawan Nordland, 2011, where they plug in uh, critical density that looks like this, um, and they get something that looks like this. It's like there's an error function in there because you integrated a log normal, so it's not really pretty, but hey, it works, right? And then you can go out and test it, right? And you can test it against observations, and you can test it against simulations. So this is a great starting point. Well, this, the tests with the simulations came uh, t 10 years ago, actually, there was a really nice paper by Christoph and Ralph in 2012 that did all these tests of different cr uh, groups, critical densities, um, you know, various arguments that they made for what, when the, the point of gravitational collapse should be, um, and uh, uh, also all other parameters like the, the real parameter and the Mach number with simulations. And what they found was that in general, uh, again, this is for the Padawan Nordland model, but there's other models that make similar sorts of scaling relations. As you increase things like the sonic Mach number, higher turbulence, right, you get a higher star formation rate per freefall time or higher efficiency per freefall time. If you keep the turbulent parameters constant, right, if you don't change that width of the log normal, like you don't change the Mach number or the virial parameter, the star formation rate should be constant, right, so that's another prediction. Um, and then, of course, this model is very sensitive to how you might start that integral, right? Where do you place that critical density in your integral? So that's, these are like the general predictions and the findings from that paper. The other thing that I think is important to point out, if you really wanted to have a predictive model for the star formation efficiency based on this like cloud scale turbulent models, you still need to put in an efficiency in by hand, right? So you need to say something about stellar feedback. Right, because not all the gas that makes it into uh, the, the log normal PDF past the critical density is going to form stars. Right? Ultimately, there's some types of feedback processes that take place that eject some of the gas or make some of the gas too hot to form stars, et cetera. And so that makes it like, difficult to go from these PDF models to like a Kennecott Schmidt type of model, right? If you have to ultimately put in kind of what's happening on the very like dense core scales of the turbulent star formation problem in by hand, it's sort of, I think there's, there's, some, there's some logical difficulty in, in going right to Kennecott Schmidt and saying you predicted the 1% efficiency. So where are we going with this, right? So how can we improve or build upon this picture that people had started kind of looking at 10 years ago and, and developing? Well, one thing and, and a critical thing, I think, for these PDF models is that the log normal isn't the end of the story, right? So now we understand from both observations and from simulations that have adaptive mesh refinement um, and, and resolve the, the self-gravitating structures in these in these uh, cloud scale simulations, that the, the log normal PDF is actually not how the dense gas looks. We actually have a power law PDF. And I think the simulators may have seen this first, right, with like 15 years ago when people started doing adaptive mesh refinement and resolving actually the gravitational collapse in the simulations, you see a power law form because gravity produces power law density distributions, not log normal ones like turbulence does. Um, when Herschel observations started coming out, people observationally in, in the dust uh, extinction and emission data also started seeing these really nice power law tail slopes in their column density PDF. So I'm showing an example um, uh, from Herschel observations published by Schneider et al. in 2014 uh, and 15 of different star forming clouds. And you can see very clearly here the PDFs look very different, but they don't look log normal, right? So there's some cases like Orion B, which is a very active star forming region with massive star formation. You have this booming power law tail out to higher and higher column densities. And if you look at a more quiescent environment like Polaris, things look kind of log normal, right? And so here's a summary cartoon on the, on the left here from Hope Chen 
um, showing basically how this density PDF is, is now viewed uh, today, where you have dense structures that form a power law, and then you have atomic gas or diffuse uh, molecular gas that forms this log normal. Okay, so we can imagine already now building this into a new model. So first it would be good to understand maybe how the power law evolves in time if we wanted to build a new analytic model that includes this. And here I'm showing a movie from David Collins, uh, who's one of my collaborators on this, where we looked uh, in, in 2015 now, already quite a long time ago, at how the power law tail evolves in, in these kind of simulations. Um, and here uh, you can see the power law tail slope, right? And as a function of time, it's becoming shallower and shallower as these simulations collapse, right? And so the boxes here, you can see the refinement uh, scheme happening in the very dense regions. Um, and, and there's also an interesting um, connection with the magnetic field, right? So these different points here uh, have uh, low magnetic field, the diamonds, and then higher magnetic field, uh, the, the triangles. And so there's an evolutionary uh, aspect to the collapse that doesn't happen just at free fall if you have a magnetic field, right? So if you had no magnetic field, that power law tail would collapse on the local free fall time. But when you add in a magnetic field, the, the development of that high density region becomes slower and slower and slower. So we can bake that all into a model. And it's a very simple model that connects very well with the previous generation of log normal turbulent regulated star formation models. We can just add in this power law. We can also say that we make the model dynamic, right? That it doesn't have to just be fixed with the turbulent parameters like the previous models were, where you just have like one Mach number, one real parameter that sets the log normal width. Um, uh, we can actually say this model can evolve with time with the power law. You can even have material that moves between the two states, right? That goes from log normal to power law. So this is really easy to do if you take a piecewise approach. So you have turbulence that sets this log normal distribution at low densities, and then you have self-gravity that then fights that to produce a power law at high densities, and you have a critical density or a transition density between those two. Um, you can solve for the transition density just purely assuming that the, the functional form here has, uh, is differentiable and continuous. Or you can just say, well, that's the, the beginning of gravity is where you get a, have a critical density. Okay, so that's the, that's the main update to this model. How does it look? Well, of course, now you have a piecewise function, so the algebra ends up looking a little more complicated. But you can move around that transition point. Uh, you can get uh, more or less dense gas in that power law tail. Um, and you can compute very, in a very similar way um, an integral over the critical density uh, for the star formation uh, rate, or the, the star formation rate per freefall time, or even the star formation efficiency. OK. So how does this compare with simulations? Um, so we can then test our model. Um, so we can do things like estimate a dense gas fraction, which would be integrating past the power law, dividing by the total gas. We can test that on simulations. And so here I'm showing you how that looks. Uh, so the points there are the numerical simulations, basically the same simulations I've been showing um, that, that uh, drive turbulence and then also turn on self-gravity. And so the, the lines there, the, the lines that track with different sonic Mach numbers are the analytic predictions. Um, and so we do a pretty good job of comparing the analytic predictions to the simulations. So this is, this is good news. Um, so that the analytic model seems to work. Uh, and then we can also say, well, what are the predictions now for the star formation rate? And how does that compare to the log normal model? Right, so here's an uh, example of just the pure analytic predictions for the log normal model, so just having turbulence. Uh, and then integrating past that critical density. So there should be, of course, no dependence on a power law slope. So those are flat. There's no evolution for those models. And then when you add in the power law and let it evolve, as it becomes flatter and flatter, you get a, a rapid increase in the star formation rate. Um, and this, of course, would be expected. You're having more dense gas, more gas is collapsing. Uh, instead of having just a purely static model, you now have uh, a time varying model. Um, and then we can say, all right, this, this, these are the predictions for the, the, the new model with the power law tail and, and gravity included. Um, how does it compare now to observations? And how does the previous model compare to observations? So this is something that we're looking into now um, with uh, Yoni Kainulainen, uh and uh, my student Sabrina Apple. So 
Uh, Yoni has a very interesting data set of dust extinction maps that are combined with uh, CO maps, uh, which have uh, velocity dispersion, so you can estimate a turbulent Mach number from those. And then from the dust extinction maps, you can get an estimate of the, the 3D PDF. There's a reconstruction method they use for the, the density PDF, and you can get a power law tail slope out of that. And so we can do kind of, uh, an ex uh, experiment where we can say, okay, how well does, does that data set match our, our predictions of these different turbulent regulated star formation models? Um, so these are individual molecular clouds that are local. Um, so like things like Orion A and Taurus, you, you're probably uh, have, are familiar with. There's some other clouds that don't have uh, such nice names that maybe you're not familiar with. But what you can see here right away is that the star formation rate this is uh, estimated directly from counting young stellar objects in these local clouds, so that's about as good as it gets for estimating star formation rates. Um, and the uh, power loss slope kind of follow in a, in a very similar way, right, as to our prediction. So there's a flat regime and then there's an increasing regime as you go to shallower and shallower power law tail slopes. So this is pretty encouraging. Similar if you look instead at the star formation rate, you can also look at the star formation efficiency. So this is um, the conversion of gas into stars on a free fall time from the observations. And again, there's a similar kind of behavior. There's a flat regime where you have uh, very steep power loss slopes, so less dense gas, you could say, and uh, a, a regime where you have a rising uh, star formation efficiency where you have uh, this, this flatter power law tail slope. So this is encouraging. The other interesting thing that's come out of these observations uh, is that there's not really a strong dependence with Mach number, right? There's maybe some dependence um, for, for the star formation rates, uh, but Mach number here on the x-axis, star formation efficiency on, on the y-axis, or star formation rate, um, not a huge Mach number dependence, um, if, if any at all. And so that's also, I think, consistent with our model, where there should be maybe some Mach number dependence, but it's subdominant to how much dense gas you have over the critical density, which should be traced by that power law tail slope. Now, the thing that I've kind of left out so far, and I'm... I'm starting to wrap up fairly soon, but I think it's very important to mention it, is feedback, right? Where does feedback enter into this model? We know now feedback from stars, so this again could be immediate feedback processes like winds, jets, and ionizing radiation. It could be supernova, which is, is a few mega years later. Uh, is very important for setting the star formation efficiency in particular, and these are beautiful simulations from Mike Grudich, which I'm gonna show again. Uh, an experimental um, uh, simulation where they changed uh, either including feedback or not including feedback, changing the, the gas surface density of these, of these uh, star forge simulations, as they call them, uh, and seeing what happens to the efficiency as it evolves in time. Uh, and right away, I just want to point out that when you have no feedback, so this would be a case like if you just considered turbulence and gravity in your, in your simulation in magnetic fields, right? So similar to the movies I've been showing you so far, no stellar feedback whatsoever. You can see that eventually you just go to a observationally unrealistic high efficiency for star formation, right? Maybe even eventually you get to 100% efficiency. All the gas just ends up collapsing. And that makes sense because you don't disrupt the cloud in some way. Even if star formation is slow, if you don't disrupt it, eventually everything is going to collapse and form stars. So feedback has to enter here somehow. How does it do that? Well, that's something that we've been studying with my student Sabrina Apple uh, and Christoph Federath, where we've been looking at simulations uh, that include various forms of physics, so magnetic fields, uh, gravity and turbulence, similar to what I've shown so far, and then also adding in various feedback processes. Um, so here you can see, these are from Christoph Federath, two simulations um, that include very similar initial conditions, uh, but the one on the right here includes uh, feedback in the form of winds and jets, um, and it will take much, much longer to reach uh, star formation efficiency of, of about 10%, the integrated star formation efficiency when this gets turned off. Um, and uh, you can see that the gas is much more dynamic, especially the jets are, are 
you know, blowing these big cavities, these big holes in the simulations, um, and preventing gas from collapsing. Uh, and so in the, in the context of the model I was just showing you, this is gas that's being ejected out of this power log tail region back into this diffuse uh, supported log normal region and being prevented from finally forming stars. So if you look at the star formation efficiency of these models, actually the only model uh, that's able to get about this couple percent per freefall time is when you include the feedback, right? That's this blue line here, right? So, you know, this is the only one that's roughly linear, right? So per freefall time around a few percent. Interestingly, when you include magnetic fields, it's at, in the first freefall time about as slow, but eventually it, the magnetic pressure is not able to keep the cloud supported um, and, and keep the efficiency low enough to be uh, in agreement with the observations. Right? So what about the context of this analytic model? How does this feedback effect work? And that's something that Sabrina uh, has been studying. Um, and uh, a cartoon version of this right, is, is here from our uh, paper with uh, Philip Motz in 2019, where you have this gas cycling effect. Right? So you have gas that is gravitationally unstable, starts to form this power law tail. Feedback then prevents it from completely collapsing um, and, and forming stars, and then you hit this cycling effect. And this is exactly what Sabrina sees in, in these simulations, um, where you uh, have a cycling effect between the star-forming state of the gas uh, at the high densities and the non-star-forming state at the low densities. Right? And we can ask ourselves, well, what, you know, what provides that final core efficiency that the log normal models always were wanting, like to put in kind of a 40% uh, efficiency there. So when we compute that, right, we get about, about between 30 and 40% uh, is our predicted core efficiency, right, converting between that power law tail portion and the final star formation that we see in the simulations. Um, and so I think that's really interesting that we're also basically predicting exactly what those, the, the observations see in terms of the core efficiency. Um, between, they say between 20 and 50 percent is that final conversion of dense star forming gas, which we would call the power law tail gas, uh, to, to star formation. So the last thing I'll show and wrap up is, um, again, a, a test with the, 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 with the observations, right? We can say, well, right, we have the observed star formation rate from counting directly the young stellar objects, right? How would that compare to what the theory would directly predict, right? If we if, it, if instead I say I don't know anything about the actual star formation rate of the cloud, all I know is what my model gets, right? So the power law tail slope, I know that. I know the Mach number, so I can kind of estimate a width based on the Mach number. I don't maybe know that driving parameter, right? The, the B parameter that depends on how compressive the turbulence is or how solenoidal the turbulence is. But maybe I can just take some reasonable range for that. So that could be like an uncertainty. And then I know the mean density of the cloud. So that's actually all you need to plug into this PDF model. And then you can compare that actually to the YSOs, right? And so that's exactly what this plot is doing. So here on the y-axis, this is the star formation rate based on just pure YSO counts. The actual star formation rate from the observations, you could say. And then here is our model. And you know we're doing, I think, reasonably well, given all the uncertainties in the data. This is preliminary. Uh, results, um, but I think it's exciting to see that we're able, without any kind of efficiency FUD factors, just purely trusting that the density PDF is like a fingerprint of the dynamics of the star forming environment with feedback and gravity and turbulence all competing with each other. Uh, this seems to work reasonably well. So the, again, this is, this is in prep work, but uh, I think an exciting kind of proof of concept for this type of analytic model. And again, if you have some estimate of the dense gas, you can imagine very easily putting a model like this into a cosmological simulation in the future as a subgrid model. And I will kind of wrap up with a look to the future. Um, so Ralph at the start mentioned this telescope called Hyperion. And this is, I think, a really exciting new way of looking at the dynamics of gas, right? Which I, in this picture I presented today, I was talking about um, the, the density PDF as an imprint of the dynamics. Right? But we fundamentally never can truly see the full distribution of molecular gas. Right? Most of the molecular gas is in uh, the form of molecular hydrogen, um, which the only uh, way to observe that in emission is to look at the fluorescing hydrogen emission uh, as the cloud is being uh, dissociated and formed. So it's really like the boundary layer of the molecular cloud. 
Um, and one needs to have a, a FUV spectrograph in order to do this with a large field of view. Um, and so Hubble, right, this picture here showing uh, uh, the sort of Hubble kind of field of view here, uh, clearly wouldn't be able to map the entire boundary layer of a molecular cloud, which for the giant molecular clouds can be uh, hundreds of parsecs wide. Um, and so Hyperion is a proposed mission to do this. Uh, this FUV spectrograph with a large field of view will be able to look at the boundary layer of molecular gas in and out of the cloud um, and, and fundamentally see how mass is flowing in and out of, of the molecular cloud. How does that connect to star formation? So very uh, complementary to this dynamical picture I presented today with the density PDF. Um, and so if this interests you, I'd be happy to chat more about it. Um, and with that, I'm going to conclude. So in the talk today, I showed a range of observations, numerical simulations, and theory. And it, these are the main takeaway points that I'd like you to walk home with. Observationally, right, I talked about the star formation efficiency. There's about, it's about 1%, but there's a lot of scatter in that 1%. And I think the, one, the scatter is actually meaningful. Right, if you have an efficiency of 10% down to 0.1%, I think that's telling you something about the dynamical state of the cloud, where it's at in its evolution. That can be nicely traced with the model I showed. Um, and we, you know, we can test that also with numerical simulations. Um, and I showed a lot of those simulations, movies, maybe it was too quick. So if it was, you can go check them out at mhdturbulence.com. That's where the catalog for astrophysical turbulence lives. And there, of course, are space cats there. So you will be uh, greeted with a nice space cat if you go to that website. Uh, and then finally, I presented an analytic model for all of these complications that really tries to break down the interplay between turbulence, gravity, feedback, magnetic fields. Ultimately, you can take that all down into a one-point statistic, the density PDF, which acts like a fingerprint for those physical processes. And I think the comparisons between the simulations and the observations are promising at this point. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blakesley, for this pedagogical and sort of at least followable explanation of Good. this extremely <laughs> complicated phenomena. Um, I'm sure that there will be some questions um, from the audiences, both on the Zoom and here in the hall. And what I'd propose to do is first take questions from the hall, if anybody would like to stand up. So one in the middle there. Ah, yes, Henry. I think they won't hear you on Zoom without the mic. Okay. Yeah. From a naive observer's point of view, we often don't have the density PDF, but rather the column density PDF. Yep. And we often also don't have really the log normal part, sensitivity. Yep close contours, other issues. So we usually just have the slope of the column density PDF. Can we infer quantitative parameters of that in addition to say, well, yeah, it's pretty flat, star formation should be ongoing. Could we get time scales or something just from the slope or are there too many ambiguities that this is hard? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so I think there's, Right now, at least uh, th that we're looking into, there's kind of two methods for get taking a column density slope and making it a volume density slope. So there's, is this hard, right? So there's this reconstruction method that was published by Yoni Kainulainen, Christoph Federath, and Thomas Henning in 2014. Um, there's, there's more papers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a couple papers on that. Um, yeah, Ralph also has published some conversions between uh, volume and column slopes for the slope. So I think for the slope, it's actually definitely, and we're also with an undergrad testing with the feedback simulations, this conversion between column slope and volume slope. And I think there it's a much safer conversion um, than trying to estimate the properties of the log normal width from the PDF. I think there, there's so many um, like line of sight confusion, um, boundary layer effects, like where you draw the, the closed contour, et cetera, that our approach so far has been to say, well, what we do have is the sonic Mach number. And so we can estimate what the width should be, would be, if we trust that the width is what controls the, 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 the Mach number controls the width of the PDF. So we don't try to measure the, the width of the PDF directly from the column density. We instead take the sonic Mach number 
and an estimation of the B parameter and infer the width from that. And that's what goes into the comparison with the star formation rate. Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple of more questions from the hall. I'll pass over to Heinz Falk first. Could you repeat, please, your arguments about the relative strength of the turbulence and stellar outflows? The relative strength. Um, for the star formation rate? Um, well, I think it's a, the argument here, if I understand the question correctly, is, is that there, there are different phases of the cloud where one is more important than the other. So in the very initial phases of star formation, right, and for examples, you can think of like starless cores. So regions in the galaxy, molecular clouds, that don't seem to have any stars formed yet, but they're very dense and they seem to be collapsing. There, the, the turbulence of the cloud, right, and the gravity and the magnetic fields is all you have. You don't have any stellar feedback. So it will be like the very early phases of the model I'm showing where you start to develop that power law tail and you just have a log normal and a power law. So after the first stars start forming, then you begin to stir up the cloud from the effects of stellar feedback. So the, the, the newly formed stars will eject jets and winds and radiation and they will start to produce this mass cycling effect. And what we found in the simulations is that this effect, it's slow at first, but after the first sort of mega year or so, the first free fall time of the cloud, it becomes very dynamically important um, and fundamentally keeps the whole cloud from collapsing on a, you know, more than about 1% or so free fall time. So wh where one dominates the other depends on the evolution, yeah. Okay, I think uh, Ralph had a question. Blakesley, many thanks for this very nice presentation. I have a similar question to, um, to Hendrix. And if one looks at um, Nicola Schneider's PDFs that you have presented, right. she also has PDFs not just in dust column densities, but also in H1 and H2. Right. And uh, future missions will produce also other molecular species. Yep. And they are very similar to some degree, but there are also market differences. And I'm wondering whether this could be used to constrain your models to more precision, to have more predictive power and stuff like that. I, I think definitely the more tracers we have, the better. I think especially for, you know, I, I think the dust extinction is, is doing a pretty good job of estimating the slope, right? So we. We can see that in, in numerical simulations where we have the full you know, 3D volume slope, and then we can look at different tracers. Um, uh, and, and the dust extinction tracers seem to do a pretty good job of recovering that. But the, the problem is, again, the low density, right? this log normal. And so H1 could be uh, important for, for also filling in the gaps of where the, the molecular tracers or the dust at very low densities or extinctions um, has trouble. Yeah, I agree. I think with, with, with the dust, you are closer to the total, let's say, gas distribution, but there's also temperature in the equation that yeah. you have neglected. And I think the chemistry can help you to learn more about the temperature distribution, yes. which I think is the unknown in the, the quantity least well understood in these models. Right. Yeah, this model basically assumes an isothermal, mostly isothermal medium. And I think for the large scales, that's you know, the sort of CO traced gas, that's reasonable. But if you go very close to a star, that's obviously not a good assumption. Um, so the effective temperatures, yeah, I think we could do a better job of including that there. So. OK. Um, we're still waiting for a question from Zoom audience. So um, if oh, I may. One, I think oh, we have one. OK, now Christian. Yeah, okay, so my question is about the star formation uh, slopes you were presenting. So we're comparing the slopes between the theory and observations. And the slope actually uh, was a quite a nice fit uh, for both these um, results. But what is uh, the, the, the scaling of the vertical axis was a bit different. Can you show this slide again? So it looked like there was a factor 100 difference in the, in the efficiency. Yeah. yeah, this one here. Yes. So there's 10 to minus 4 and 10 to minus 7 somehow. So can you yes. comment uh, on this? You're, you're, you're to totally right. Um, so we're not, uh, I, I didn't try to overplot these lines on this plot here. 
And the reason why I didn't is because all of these different clouds, like Orion A or Lupus, they all have very different masses. So some clouds are much more massive than others. Um, and here for this model comparison, they all have the same mass. So uh, you know, in, in this sort of parameter space, you need to fold in the, the amount of gas mass you have in the cloud. And that's why the dynamic range here is much, much greater, because the observations span orders of magnitude difference in, in gas mass. Um, I think a fairer yeah. comparison would be to put them all on the efficiency here, mm. right? Where you've, you know, the efficiency is, is a dimensionalist number that doesn't have, you know, units of, like the star formation rate, right? Solar masses per year. Okay. Um, so this is, this is in prep work that, that we can explore further. OK, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay, Christian, thank you. Uh, I guess that's answered your question. Um, do we have another question from the hall? Not at the moment. I'd just like to make, ask a sort of very naive question, if I may. You talked about the mass circulation. You know, you took mass through feedback out of the power law distribution back into sort of the turbulent um, distribution. Um, but isn't it a lot more complicated than that? Because actually what you, what you take out is energy and might be in the form of motion or it might even be photons and some other energy then goes back into, into the turbulent motion and heats it up. And probably the scale on which the heating occurs depends on the sort of form of feedback. Right. I mean, yes. can, you, can you make a comment on that? Please? Yes, yes. I think the way to think of it is gas that's uh, collapsing if, uh, versus gas that's not collapsing. And so all the complications that you talked about, like the energy and photons, like it could be heating, it could be changing the chemi chemistry of the gas. But fundamentally, the gas that's collapsing is, is cold, it's molecular, it's dense, and the, the supportive terms, like the magnetic pressure support, the turbulent pressure, the thermal pressure, are not enough to keep it from ultimately collapsing. Sure, I understand so that. I understand that for the actual forming clump. Right. But I mean, isn't, isn't the amount of gas that gets to that critical point on, on the turbulent distribution dependent on that energy feedback and the scales on which it is deposited? So, you know, the, the formation of those sort of unstable clumps. Right. Um, yes, it, it depends on the cascade, um, but if I understand what you're asking, like when you have feedback, you're yes. asking about the feedback. Yes. So the feedback can also drive turbulence internally on small scales, so that could be another factor that just simply makes it uh, no longer able to collapse, right? And so in the simulations where we include feedback, we also see that the Mach number increases yeah. with time as you, as you increase the, the feedback. All right. Um, so like, that, all like of those things are, are, are very complicated, yeah. right? Um, and they're difficult to simulate, but the model itself, it doesn't care. It just says what gas is star okay. forming, what gas is, is not understand. star forming. Uh, yeah. And your, your, your model has obviously got a lot of predictive power, so that is an interesting observation in itself. Well, um, are there any questions from anywhere else? I, I'm looking at the Zoom audience. I don't see any at the moment. So I think the time has come just to wrap up. And before we thank Blakesley, I'd like to make an announcement. So um, I'm just go put this um, thing up here. And that is that here. So first of all, there is next week's colloquium. And as you will see, <laughs> we've laid a little trap in the way for you, but I mean, in a very nice way, Good. because um, we're actually going straight to the observations and, of course, who better than Ava Chinera, who has led this big consortium to map in great detail stars, dust and gas in, and in very nearby galaxies. And so I think we'll hear quite a lot more about observations of turbulence next week. So please tune in, everybody. So now it's, uh, we thank Blakesley again for this really interesting and very informative uh, talk. And we wish you all the best in future um, analyses and the future comparisons with data. Thank you very much, Blakesley. Thank you. Yeah.